There's still plenty of comfy seats up here in the front, so feel free, don't be bashful. Well, good evening, everybody. Welcome. Uh, por los que uh, usan interaccio, uh, tuve que ser live en este momento. Si no está funcionando, vamos a tener un speaker en el centro parroquial si necesita la tecnología y no está funcionando. Pero ellos me dijeron que está funcionando. Ojalá que sí. Vamos a rezar. Okay. Let's go ahead and we'll begin with a prayer. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Come, Holy Spirit, fill the hearts of your faithful, and kindle in them the fire of your love. Send forth your spirit, and they shall be created, and you shall renew the face of the earth. O Lord, who did instruct the hearts of the faithful by the light of the Holy Spirit, give us the same spirit that we may be truly wise and ever rejoice in his consolation through Christ our Lord. Amen. Eternal rest grant unto them, O Lord, and let perpetual light shine upon them. May the souls of all the faithful departed to the mercy of God rest in peace. Amen. Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. During the month of November, we always pray for the deceased. You'll notice we have all the names of those who have died in the parish in the last years, uh, for several years going back. And so at every Mass, every day, we pray for the dead. This is, this is the month where we do that. And we're going to see that actually dovetails nicely with some of the themes that we have uh, here because we see some of the funerals of the patriarchs and how they, they, they related to them. We won't maybe get into too much of that, but just pay attention to how they did funerals back in the day, the importance they attached to the tombs of the patriarchs. We'll begin tonight. Tonight is not in your books, so this is bonus. <laughs> So this was not in your book for Bible Basics. So if you're looking for it, it's not there. This was extra material um, that I received when I was uh, with Dr. Bergsma and, so, and a few other things added since then. Tonight we're going through Isaac, Jacob, and Joseph. Basically, we're going to finish the book of Genesis tonight, hopefully. Cross my fingers if I stay focused, okay? So essentially what we're going to see is the connecting piece between Abraham to the formation of the 12 tribes of Israel and how they got to Egypt before we begin the Exodus in the next chapters. So we start with Isaac, who is Abraham's son we heard last time, the one who was offered to God, but of course he didn't die. And, and uh, he now is a grown man. His mother dies. That's how chapter 23 begins. Sarah dies at a ripe old age of 127. And so then she is buried in a field. Abraham buys a field, and that field has a cave in it, and that cave will become the grave for him, for, for Sarah, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and most of the rest of the patriarchs. So it's a very important place and a shrine for the Jews. Uh, I don't know if it's still, uh, I, I, think, I think they can still visit it in Hebron. So, so it's there to this day, I believe. Okay. 
Um, essentially, Isaac is a very prayerful man, and he's the most peaceful of all the patriarchs. And it's probably because he only has one wife. <laughs> so it seems to be the reason why he has a pretty fairly peaceful life among comparison to his other uh, descendants. Um, Abraham makes his servant swear to get a wife for Isaac from his kinsmen and not from the Canaanites. So he wants sons of Shem and not sons of Ham for his son's wife. And basically his servant goes, and so we read this in chapter 24, uh, he goes to the well, he goes outside the city where Abraham's relatives are, and he stops at the evening times. So this is, if you read along, this is in chapter 24, verse 11. He made the camels to kneel down outside the city by the well of water at the time of evening, the time when women go out to draw water. Notice how many people meet their wives by a well, All right? Why is that? Because carrying water is women's work. So if you want to meet the eligible bachelorettes, where do you go? The well, right? And you'll see, that's why we even today, we say you go to the watering hole to pick up a date, right? Where does that come from? It's biblical. <laughs> so that's the idea. That's where it comes from. So in any case, um, he goes there, but he doesn't know um, who it should be. And so he get, makes a test to God. He says, God, whoever comes out here and offers not only to give me a drink, but to water my camels, that's going to be the wife. Why is that? Because camels drink about 40 gallons. So if somebody's willing to water his camels, she's got to be pretty strong and very generous. And so, in fact, Rebecca, the daughter of, uh, or uh, sorry, the, uh, the, the niece, if you will, of, of Abraham comes out and he, uh, and she passes the test. Okay. So uh, the servant brings gifts to Rebecca. Laban is her brother. Rebecca's brother is named Laban. He's important later on in the story of Jacob because he's going to abuse uh, Jacob a little bit. We're going to see that later. But we notice that Laban, look at him, he sees the gifts of gold and the bracelets and all the earrings. And so he's, he's a man who's very much obsessed with money. So that's kind of a detail we're going to see later on Laban is. Okay. Anyway, Rebecca agrees to marry Isaac, goes with the servant, then get married. And, uh, and, and it seems to be a pretty decent marriage. Okay. So <clears throat> we then see that uh, they have two children. Jacob and Esau, and there's a problem here because uh, there's a difficult pregnancy. There's a lot of children struggling within her. We, see, we read in, in chapter 25, verse 22, they struggle within her, and Rebecca, she thinks it's so serious she might die. Right? There's this, this really there's a struggle going on. It's like they're beating each other up in her womb. That's what it feels like. And so there's a prophecy: two nations are in your womb, and two peoples born of you shall be divided. One will be stronger than the other. The elder will serve the younger. Okay, so there's a prophecy. Of what's going to happen? Esau comes out first, and he's a hairy man. And then Jacob grabs his heel because he is the one who supplants. And that's gonna, we're going to see that is, in fact, what he does throughout his life. Of course, they grow up a little bit more. We see that Esau is an outdoorsman. He's a hunter. And dad likes him. Jacob, however, is a mama's boy who stays home all day with mom. And so mom likes Jacob. So we have this conflict that's happening here. Um, Esau, he's kind of dumb. He's not very bright. Okay, He's kind of a man who is ruled by his passions. We see that... Uh, he comes home hungry one day. He's like, I'm starving. Give me something to eat. And Jacob's like, I'll give you porridge if you give me your birthright. And he's like, what good is the birthright if I'm dead? You know, it's like, you can make yourself some own food, man. Come on, you know. But he's so impatient that he gives his right over to Jacob. And it's just like, are you kidding me? He, he, he throws away the right of a firstborn for a bowl of soup. Pretty dumb, right? He also marries two Hittite women. So he's a man who is controlled by his lusts and by his passions. So that's the, the image we get of him. He's not a worthy successor to Isaac. And so Jacob receives uh, his, his blessing of the firstborn, and, but it's unclear whether Isaac knew that or not. So this seems to be kind of an internecine conflict. We don't know if Isaac knew that. And so Isaac is blind toward the end of his life, and he's going to give his blessing to Esau because he's the firstborn. That's what happens. Rebecca hears about this and says, no, 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 this is not going to happen. So she says, Jacob, you go out to the flock, you get a couple of goats, I'll prepare them nice. And, and Jacob's like, but I'm not hairy. <laughs> so she's like, don't worry about that. So she takes some goat hair, puts it on his shoulders, puts it on his neck. So if he feels you, it's going to be Esau, right? And then I'll dress you in his clothing so you smell like him. Anyway, the, the deception is complete and Isaac buys it surprisingly okay and uh and he blesses jacob as soon as jacob goes out it's like a sitcom revolving door esau comes in like here's your game dad He's like who did i just bless <laughs> and he will remain blessed this is what's really fascinating we recognize isaac and 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 he recognizes a blessing is permanent you can't take back a blessing isn't that interesting they really value the power of words the words once spoken you can't take them back 
And that's true for blessings and curses. So it's an important message for us. If we're made in the image and likeness of God, right, how does God create? By speaking. And so if we participate in God's image and likeness, when we speak, whether it's a blessing or a curse, that has an impact. And so as parents, we need to be very clear in what we choose to do. And as brothers and sisters, we need to be clear in how we speak to one another because that has a real great impact for good or for evil. So, so Esau, of course, is ticked, and he's like, as soon as dad dies, I'm going to kill you, right? And so Jacob's like, get out of Dodge. Okay, so Jacob uh, leaves, and, uh, and he runs away. Now, what's, what's really interesting about this is we see that Jacob receiving the blessing is actually a pattern throughout Scripture, that the firstborn rarely receives the blessing. In fact, there's only three people that receive the blessing who are firstborn children, Abraham, Noah, and Shem. Everybody else is not firstborn. Isn't that interesting? So we see that the, while first, the blessing of the firstborn was an expectation in Middle Eastern culture, in the Bible we see very clearly God subverts that. And he says the order of your birth is not the most important thing. It's whether you are pleasing to God, whether you receive the blessing. Isn't that interesting? Okay, so moving right along, um, we see that... Uh, uh, the punishment for Jacob, Jacob doesn't get away with this. The Bible's not condoning his deceit. You know, it's like he gets away with it, but not really. In fact, he's going to do penance. And the reason he's going to do penance is because he needs some virtue. Remember, he's a tent dweller. He's a mama's boy, and he's kind of a weakling. Okay? So what is God going to do? He's going to strengthen him up a little bit through suffering. And that's exactly what happens. So he has to leave home because of this decision. And so he's no longer in the comfort of his home. He, he has to work for 14 years to get the wife he wants, outdoors doing hard physical labor. So he's going to grow up. He, and he's also deceived by his uncle Laban. All right? So we read that, that, that he's deceived by his uncle Laban. And later on, he's going to be deceived by his own children who are going to lie to him about his son Joseph dying. We'll get to that. Okay? So, so we see that Jacob has to suffer a lot for this decision. Okay? But he does receive the blessing. Okay, so now we see that uh, Isaac, before he leaves, Isaac commands Jacob, don't marry any of these Hittite women, okay, because Esau married them, and that's terrible. You need to go to um, my, your, your, your mother's uh, brother's house, Laban, and marry one of his daughters, okay? So marry into the family because uh, they're better than these other people. Esau overhears this. He's like, oh, I didn't know they didn't like my wives. So he's like, I'll go marry children of Abraham, but he marries a daughter of Ishmael. So it's like... You got it kind of right, but still the wrong line. He just can't get anything right. Okay, so, it's, it's, so now he's got three wives, and they're still not happy. So there you go. Okay. So anyway, Jacob goes to Laban's house, and Laban's really uh, happy to see him because uh, he's got a, you know, an offer of work. What happens is Laban go, uh, Jacob goes to a well, again, and he runs into Rachel. Oh, and he falls in love at first sight. And he's like, I'll do anything for you, Laban, to marry your daughter, Rachel. Now, there's a problem. Uh, Rachel is the younger of the two sisters. Leah is the older sister. But she has weak eyes, we hear, which is another polite way of saying she's not so pretty. Okay? <laughs> That's the good news. The good news is that however messed up this family was, you can enter into the solution that God has provided in his son, Jesus Christ. Isn't that awesome? It's so great. That's why I love the Old Testament, right? Because every page screams to us how everything is so messed up by our own human efforts. But God can fix it. He can fix it, right? There's another story which we'll skip a little bit, but actually, uh, uh, yeah, we'll, we'll come back to that maybe later. It's a little bit more adulty. Okay. Um, I like any of these are kids' stories. Anyway, <laughs> the Bible is not a kid's book, by the way, just in case. Sorry if I scandalize some people, but it's not a kid's book because it has real issues in it. It's got real life in it, okay? Because it's, it's meant to meet us where we're at and be able to combat the culture that's a culture of death, right? Because we lived through that. The Old Testament, they lived through the culture of death. They lived through a culture of sexual violence and physical violence. And Christ came to bring peace into that. We needed a savior from it because our life was dark without him. It was lost without him. We're just a slave to our passions without him. But he offers freedom. And penance develops virtue, so we see what Jacob went through was a penance and a medicine, and we're going to see Joseph needs some penance too. So getting thrown into the well and then sold into slavery was super important for him to grow up a little bit. Right? So he does. He gets, he gets, he gets uh, sold in Egypt for slavery. So, so Reuben suggests let's throw him in the well. Let's not kill him so I can rescue him later. But while he's gone, a caravan of Ishmaelites come along, and Judah comes along and says, hey, i got a better idea. Let's sell him. So they sell him for silver. 
hmm, does that sound like another beloved son that got sold for silver somewhere in the scripture? The only beloved son of the father who was sold for a few pieces of silver? I don't know. I can't think of it. Anyway, it'll come to me. So, <clears throat> so we see, all right, now Joseph's sold into slavery, and now the brothers are like, what are we going to do? What are we going to tell dad? We're going to take that long coat, that beautiful coat. We're going to dip it in goat's blood. And then we're going to show it to dad and be like, oh, a wild animal must have got him. Now, isn't this interesting? Because now it's come full circle. How did Jacob deceive his father to receive the blessing? What did he clothe himself in? A goat. And now he's deceived by a goat. Delicious irony. Isn't that interesting? It's all so poetic. It's amazing. It's like somebody's writing this. I don't know. <laughs> right. Anyway, with an intentional purpose. Like, it's not like these are unconnected stories. They all fit together. All right. So Joseph goes uh, to, to, to Egypt and, uh, and he is placed uh, in Potiphar's house, and Potiphar's wife is a total harlot and tries to seduce him. But Joseph, surprisingly, has virtue here, and he resists her advances. But eventually she uh, accuses him falsely. He's put in jail. And uh, because of his dreams, he gets, the, it, he gets the ear of Pharaoh, where Pharaoh has a terrifying dream, and he doesn't know what it means. So Joseph is called out of prison and interprets the dream for Pharaoh. So this is what your dream means. There's going to be seven years of plenty where there's going to be tons of food, and then seven years of famine. So what you need to do is during the seven years of plenty, you need to have a wise person collect enough food so we can survive the famine. And Pharaoh's like, that sounds great. You're the dude, <laughs> right? You're going to be the prince. You're the second in command under me, and you're going to be in charge of collecting the food so that we have enough for when there is a famine, right? So Joseph is put in charge over his whole household, right? He made him the lord of his household, and prince over all his possessions. Doesn't that sound, that's so weird. It's like we say that someplace. I don't, huh, weird. I'll, I'll think of it. Okay. So anyway, uh, Joseph, um, he does, he collects things. Where am I right now? Okay, yes. Good, almost there. Okay. So, so Joseph, he does, he does collect food, and the famine does come just as he predicted. And now everyone wants to be in want. Everyone is in want, including Jacob and all the rest of the kids. They're experiencing famine as well, and so they hear there is food in Egypt. So Jacob sends the sons, but not Benjamin, because he's the only beloved son left of Rachel. Again, clear favoritism, right? But at this point in time, the sons, uh, after they saw how Dad was shaken up over. Joseph, they repented of doing it, right? They're just like, this really made our lives more difficult because dad is just in deep depression and nothing can console him, right? So they go to Egypt, but Joseph is in costume, of course, and so they don't recognize him. They're not expecting to see him there. And he recognizes them. And, uh, and he says, okay, you guys go back and you get Benjamin, your son that you talked about, this other son of your, this other brother of yours, and that'll prove that you're not lying. I think you're spies. So he wants to test them to see if they've readily repented and changed or not. And so he sends them home while keeping Simeon in jail as kind of hostage. And uh, he sends them home with their money as well as food, so he doesn't take any payment, but he and secretly puts it back. They come back to Jacob, and Jacob's like, this is terrible. Like, our money came back with us. He's going to think you stole it from him. Like, we can't go back. They're like, Father, we have to go back. Simeon's in jail, and we have to bring Benjamin. He's like, no way. Not going to happen. Reuben gives an, a bright idea. He says, hey, guess what? If we take Benjamin and something bad happens to him, you can kill my two sons. He's like, eh. So what's, let, me, let, me, let, me play, let me play this out, Reuben. Okay, so what you're saying is, is that if I lose my favorite son, I can kill two of my grandchildren and make me feel better. That is the dumbest idea I have ever heard, okay? Not happening, right? So they decide to just stay for a while, and then they use up all their food, and Jacob's like, well, we have to go back to Egypt. And, and the guys, remember, Dad, we said we can't go back to Egypt unless we bring Benjamin. So Judah suggests something different. He says, Father... If anything happens to Benjamin, my life I will offer for his. This plan is acceptable. See, what's happening is there's been a, transfer, a transformation that's happened in Judah, right? Judah was a type of Judas who sold his brother for silver. Now he's a type of Jesus who's willing to offer his life for his brother. You see that change that's happened to him? It's pretty radical, right? And we see that now he's becoming the man who is worthy of the blessing, Interesting, huh? So they go to Egypt, and of course, um, through, uh, uh, through a, a series of events, um, J Joseph re uh, reveals himself to his brothers and, uh, and, and says, look, it's me. Uh, how's dad? And they're all like, 
oh my gosh, we're dead. <laughs> He's going to kill us. He's like, no, don't worry, guys. I've forgiven you because what you meant for evil, God has turned out for good. God put me here for a reason. So what Joseph has now is real wisdom of recognizing that even in the midst of difficult situations, God can make anything turn out for the good. You guys meant this to be evil, but God made it to be a blessing that I can, because I'm here, because you guys sold me into slavery. Imagine, isn't this amazing? In God's providence, that he uses even an evil situation to bring about the salvation of the whole world, right? Because without Joseph, wouldn't necessarily have known there was a famine coming, wouldn't have stored up the food, and they all would have died. Isn't that amazing? Like, you're just, you kind of scratch your head and you think, wow, was there a plan B? Or was this the plan all along? It's fascinating. Like, it just, it makes you stop and think. It's, it's really amazing. In any case, um, they, they basically, they go back uh, to their dad and say, hey, dad, uh, guess what? Joseph's not dead. Uh, he's like, what? <laughs> so that's a fun conversation. <clears throat> and then uh, they convince uh, dad to come home, to come to Egypt and to bring everybody with him. Because Joseph says, uh, hey, there's room for you guys here. And uh, Pharaoh, I have Pharaoh's ear. And Pharaoh, he hears, oh, wow, your family's here? Yeah, okay, sure, bring them over here. You're, you're great. You've saved Egypt. We can bring your family over here. And you guys can have whatever land you want. But the, Egyptians don't like shepherds. So that's one thing. The animals, shepherding, they, they don't like shepherds. And so he basically says, you can have this little land over here that's just slightly away from Egypt, like right here in this little ghetto over here. It's called Goshen. You can stay there. It's really nice, nice shepherding land, but that way you're not in Egypt proper, so you defile the rest of the Egyptians. Okay. Cool deal. We like that. We don't want to hang out with Egyptians either. So we'll just, we'll stay where we are at. They move down. There's 70 people, all Jacob, his, their wives, and their descendants. So 70 people, again, isn't that number interesting? The fullness Right? They all come down. So 70 people come down to Egypt, and they're going to stay there for the next 400 years. And that's where Exodus is going to pick up. All right? So at the end, we're just going to come really to the end of this. What we have now is that Jacob, he's dying. He's toward the end of his life, and he's going to give blessings to all of his kids, or some of them, as we're going to see. This is in chapter 49. So here's where we see kind of the, the setup for everything we talked about of what's going to happen here. So... Jacob called his sons, this is chapter 49, and said, Gather yourselves together that I may tell you what will befall you in the days to come. So now he's going to have a prophetic preja vu of what's going to happen. Reuben, you are my firstborn, my might, the first fruits of my strength, preeminent in pride, preeminent in power, unstable as water. You will not have preeminence because you went up to your father's bed and you defiled it. So he's like, very clear. Eh, you're out. Okay. Simeon and Levi. Our brothers, weapons of violence are their swords. Oh, my soul, come not into their counsel. My spirit be not joined to their company. In anger they slay men. In their wantonness they hamstring oxen. Cursed be their anger, for it is fierce. I will divide them in Jacob and scatter them in Israel. And this is, in fact, what happens. Simeon's tribe will eventually be assumed into... Um, which tribe? Do they? I, I forget which one they, they go into. Ah, did I get rid of it? Darn it, I didn't write it down. Ah, shoot. Anyway... Yes, in any case, Simeon's tribe will eventually get assimilated into one of the other tribes. And Levi becomes the priests. So the priests come from Levi, and they don't have an inheritance in the, in the promised land. They're scattered. So they actually, both of these things come true, and they are not in the line for the blessing. And now we come to Judah's blessing. Judah, your brothers shall praise you. Your hand will be on the neck of your enemies. Your father's sons will bow down before you. So he has the royal kingly blessing for the family. So, and from the line of Judah comes Christ Jesus. Okay? Judah's a lion's whelp. From the prey, my son, you've gone up. He stooped down. He lurked as a lion, as a lioness who dares rouse him up. Now, listen to this. The scepter will not depart from Judah, nor the ruler's staff from between his feet, until he comes to whom it belongs, and to him shall be the obedience of the peoples. Woo! Get chills there, right? There's going to be a royal authority, and it's going to pass from generation to generation until it gets to one particular person. And then from him, all the obedience of the nations will be due. Woo! Ah, got it again, chills again, right? He says this, binding his foal to the vine and his donkey's colt to the choice vine, he washes his garments in wine and his vesture in the blood of grapes, his eyes will be red with wine, his teeth white with milk, right? This is a prefigurement of the passion, right? Washes his garments in wine, right? In blood, right? Ah, oh, so good. So right in the first chapters, the first book, you have already prefigurement of what's going to happen. Although it's veiled, we won't know it until the revelation comes and the veil is taken from our eyes and we see it play out in front of us. Prophecy is never clear when it's happening. So when they're hearing this, they're like, I don't know what that means. 
And that's the problem. Is like anyone who says, oh, I know what's going to happen. It's like prophecy is never 100% certain because we don't know. It's in veiled language, right? But only afterwards we see very clearly, right? So when Christ comes, it becomes very clear what all this is about. The other, the other brothers, they get various blessings, um, kind of interesting things. And now we come down to verse 22 where we get a blessing for Joseph. Joseph is a fruitful bough by the spring. His branches run over the wall. The archers fiercely attacked him, shot at him, yet his bow remained unmoved. His arms were made agile by the hands of the mighty one. Now here's what's confusing. We come to verse 25. By the God of your father who will help you, by God Almighty who will bless you with blessings of heaven above, blessings of the deep, blessings of the breasts and the womb. This sounds like the blessing he received from his father Isaac. So it's confusing. Who got the blessing? Was it Judah? Was it Joseph? And this is the whole problem. Jacob introduces the ambiguity. We have a royal kingly blessing that's given to Judah, but it seems like there's a second blessing, a princely kind of abundance blessing that's given to Joseph. Fascinating, right? So that is, in fact, the whole where the fault line falls. Okay, good. Then Jacob dies, and they bury him in the cave at Machpelah, where Abraham and Sarah and Isaac and Rebekah and Leah are all buried. And then at the end of the chapter, uh, Joseph, we see his last days. And at the end of chapter 50, Joseph took an oath of the sons of Israel saying, God will visit you and you'll carry up my bones from here. So Joseph died there being 110 years old and they embalmed him and he was put in a coffin in Egypt. That's the end of Genesis. Okay, now with the few minutes we have left, I want to just flip this over. You can see a couple of themes that are here. We're just typology that we talked about and something we didn't talk about. So there's a couple of types that are really clear in this. One is Jacob's ladder and Bethel, right? Jesus references Jacob's ladder in John 151. So actually, this is one of your discussion questions. I want you to look up John 151 in your discussions and see how Jesus applies this image. What does that say about him? What is he saying about himself when he's comparing himself to Jacob's ladder and this place, Bethel, this house of God? What could that mean, right? Um, Then we see, as I mentioned, Judah. Judah. First, he's an image of Judas, and then he's an image of Jesus. And we see Joseph. There's a ton of great typology that's here, right? As we mentioned, right, Joseph, he's a man who has dreams, and he hears the word of God and his plan. Who else had dreams? Joseph, right? St. Joseph, who heard God's voice in dreams and followed him immediately and and thus saved uh, the whole world through saving Jesus, right, the savior of the world. We also see Joseph, he... He, um, what, what's, a, what's a couple other things they do here? Okay. Um, he's Lord over all the king's possessions and his treasures, right? So his master, Pharaoh, he's in charge of all of his possessions. St. Joseph's master, God, he's in charge of all of his possessions. His greatest treasures are Mary and Jesus. And Joseph is given charge over them, right? We also see that uh, Joseph feeds the whole world with bread from Egypt. And St. Joseph, after taking the bread of life into Egypt and guarding it there for a time, then brings it out to the whole world. Ooh, that butt. <laughs> Joseph feeds the world with the bread of life. Ah, so good. Anyway, there's, there's lots more uh, things about St. Joseph and Jesus. And the last one's a little bit obscure. And this one, again, typology is not perfect. I want to remind everybody of that. Typology gives us little glimpses, but if you push an analogy too hard, it falls apart. So I want to caveat that with this one. Rebecca is an image of Mary. How so? Because look at what happens. Jacob is not going to receive the father's blessing because he doesn't look like the son the father loves. So what does Rebecca do? She takes the work of Jacob, the two goats, makes it into a meal that Jacob likes, and then covers him and clothes him in the virtues of the son that the father loves so that he becomes acceptable. Just so, when we come to Our Lady, when we pray, Mary makes our works acceptable to the Lord, and she makes us look like the beloved son, Jesus. She conforms us to his image, right? Of course, she does it by deceit, so that's it's not the perfect type, right? But the fact is, we're supposed to look through that and see interesting, right? Where someone formerly wasn't going to receive the blessing, through the intercession of the mother, he does. See how powerful the intercession of the mother is, right? So in any case, that's, those are some typology. We didn't get to Onanism, which uh, if you look that up in Genesis 38, you see the sin of Onan, which is one of the catechism's references for why masturbation is a sin, right? So it's very clear that we look at that. Um, we weren't able to talk about that. And then also implicit critique of polygamy. Again, the Bible in the Old Testament never explicitly condemns polygamy. 
And that's the problem, as we see that, okay, it's permitted. And we see many people in the Old Testament had multiple wives. But all throughout the pages of Scripture, I hope you can see, it shows us there are problems whenever you have more than one wife. So it lays the groundwork, and it critiques it all the way through. Anyway, that's where we're at, and we'll stop right there. Um, at this point in time, um, uh, I'll, I'll excuse the RCAA candidates for those who are, are preparing for sacraments, adults. Um, you can go with Danielle right now into the parish hall. And then the other uh, small groups, um, I just ask you to look at maybe three questions. First, as I mentioned, that uh, John uh, 151, to look at that and to see uh, what, what we can t- see about Jesus' interpretation of himself, what his purpose is, connected to Jacob's ladder. Second, as I mentioned, the Bible's very open about the faults of the patriarchs. It shows them to be very imperfect people. Does that encourage you or depress you? And why? Or why not? And the third, anything else you want to talk about? Anything else you learned that was interesting that you can apply to your life? Okay? Sound good. Break. Middle school up here. High school up here. Yeah. So Isaac, mm. right? Yeah. His dad was so old.
Okay. Good. Middle, middle school, if we can, we can get up a little bit closer and just fill up the front, that'd be great. We've got too much space. High school, too. We can just keep moving on front. Yep, keep on. Yep. Up and move forward. Up, move forward. Thank you. Come on, move up front. Keep on. Yep. That way we don't have to yell. It's good. All right. Good. Okay. We'll start with questions. Got something a little different for tonight. Um, so I wanted just before we moved into that, I wanted to see were there any questions from tonight or anything that struck you that you wanted to ask about? You can raise a hand. Bring a microphone over to you if there was anything that you wanted more clarification on, if something wasn't clear, or if there's something interesting that you thought. You all figured it out. All perfectly clear. Got it. All right. Cool. Well, then tonight, guys, what I want what I want to talk about tonight um, is something really special that we have in the Catholic Church. Um, and I think what we're going to be doing in the next few weeks as we go through stuff is to talk about prayer and different kinds of prayer and uh because it's come to my attention that it seems like we may not know how to pray or it may not be something that we're very good at and i think this is something when if we know how to pray it's going to change our lives right so um how many of you feel like you're really good at praying okay right so it's, it's saying nobody really feels that comfortable confident that, that like i really do this well and in fact that's the truth of the matter all of us have difficulty praying, even myself. I have a hard time praying sometimes, right? Because prayer is a relationship. It's not a static thing. It's not like you do these things and then it's always going to work out great. Just like your friendships, it's not just if you say all the right things, they're going to work out right all the time. It's difficult, okay? So what I want to share with you tonight is um, there's some particular things in the Catholic Church that help us to pray. And one of those things is relics. So I want to share, how many of you know what a relic is? Okay, a few of you. Okay. Who knows what a relic is? All right, go ahead. Who, all right, go ahead. What's a relic? Or right, we need a microphone over there. Yeah. Got it. A relic is something that, uh, that was associated with the saint. A first class relic is a piece of the saint, uh -huh. like some of their ashes or a bit of their bone. Uh -huh. Second class relic was a bit of their clothes. Third class relic is anything that was touched by the by first or uh, first or second class relics. Excellent. This man has been to our relic tour and knows his relics. Awesome. Now, I don't know if you know this or not, but the cool thing about our Catholic Church is that we actually have uh, all of the stuff that's talked about in the Bible, most of it, right? And most of the events of Jesus' life, like the instruments of the Passion, the nails, the cross, the crown of thorns, we have all these things. You can see them. And in fact, one of the greatest relics we have here at our church is a piece of the cross that Jesus died on. Did you know that? We actually have a piece of the Holy Cross, and it's this one right here that I've covered over here. So, in this container, in this reliquary, is, are a couple of splinters, very tiny pieces of the wood that was taken, shaved off of the cross where Jesus died. How do we know that this is a piece of the cross where Jesus died? Very good question. Who here knows that one? Somebody hasn't answered yet. Yes, Douglas. You don't know. Do you know how? Okay. Who here knows how we know that the cross is the real cross. How do we know that? Go ahead. Go ahead. When they were looking for the cross, they had a sick woman lay on top of all of the crosses that they found, and then one of the crosses, she was healed? That's correct, yes. So St. Helena, who's the mother of Emperor Constantine, in the 4th century, they went to the Holy Land. They were looking for the relics of the Passion. They were trying to find the cross. They were trying to find the crown of thorns, all the things that this Bible talks about. And she thought, we can find these things. And they found the place where Calvary was. And they went digging. And they found a bunch of crosses just buried in the ground. They're like, well, there's a bunch of crosses. We have no idea if any one of these is the one where Jesus died. So what are we going to do? The scientific method. So they took somebody who was about to die. And they went and they had her touch each of the crosses one by one. And then when she touched one of them, she was instantly cured. 
Pretty cool, huh? So the scientific method, the church doesn't ask you to believe stuff just because it said so, right? And the fact is they took that cross then and they cut it up into several pieces and they spread it around the world. The big piece is in Jerusalem and in Rome. And then this piece was shaved off by a bishop in Rome in the 1980s. And so we have the paperwork and the documentation for it, right? So we don't ask you to believe anything without proof, but I can tell you there have been many healing miracles that have happened. People who have been physically sick who by touching the relic with faith have been healed, right? So I want to offer that to you. That What I'm doing is I'm going to lay up these in the front, and I'm just going to give you time after I explain what they are. You can come up and you can interact with each one of these, right? I'm going to share with you, like, there's some beautiful ones we have here. So this is the cross, and we're going to put this one right here. We have several others which are quite phenomenal. This one doesn't look like much, but this is a picture of St. Catherine of Siena. How many of you know St. Catherine of Siena? This is not what she looks like. This is her tomb, right? This was, I went to Rome and I took this and I touched it to her tomb. So this is a third class relic of St. Catherine of Siena. So if you like her, she's my favorite. So that's that one there. This one is another first class relic of a saint who's St. Vincent Pallotti. Vincent Pallotti is the founder of the Palatine Fathers in Rome. And he was especially devoted to helping the youth of Rome. So if you are in need of anything, any difficulty, St. Vincent Pallotti wants to pray for you. He cares for you because right now the saints in heaven, they are alive and they're still praying for us now. How many of you know what saint day it is today? What's today's feast day? Anybody know? Who, what saint do we celebrate today? Anybody have any idea? Yes. I don't know his name by the top of my head, but the, the barber, uh, yes. was a doctor at the end of the spectrum. Yes. So his name was St. Martin de Porres. Martin de Porres. Um, he was a, a mixed-race man. He was a Spanish father and a black mother. And he, he was very, very mistreated in his life. He was, he was born into poverty, but he had healing gifts. And he was very humble, and he healed a lot of people, right? And even after his death, his tomb became a place of miracles. I don't have his relics, but I'm just saying that what happens is the reason why we have the relics of the saints is because God chooses to use the bodies of the saints even now to communicate healing grace to us. It's a sign of his goodness. And remember, when you're baptized, what happens to you? You become one with Jesus, right? And whenever you receive Holy Communion, you're filled with Jesus. And when you're confirmed, when you receive your confirmation, you're going to be filled with the Holy Spirit. So your body is holy. And it's holy even after you die, as long as you do holy things in it during this life. And the proof of that is, is that the bodies of the saints, even now, heal people. Isn't that remarkable? It's so good. We've got more, though. We've got more. This is Blessed Solanus Casey. He's a priest from uh, Michigan. So he died just in the last century. So he's very new, blessed. He's not a saint yet. But he was a, a poor, uh, not very smart priest. He, well, he actually wasn't able, he, he was ordained a priest, but he wasn't allowed to preach because he wasn't very smart. He couldn't pass his tests. But he was very holy. So if you feel like, I'm not smart, I can't be holy, yes, you can. And he was a man who prayed with people who came to the door. His job was to man the door. And so he, when people came to the door, he would pray with them. And many people would be healed. There were many healing miracles through Blessed Solanus Casey. When I and my staff went to Michigan, I took a bunch of these cards and touched them to his tomb, to his relics. Okay? So if you want a prayer card of his, I have a few extras here. You can take one for yourself, okay, if you would like. And you can have a third-class relic of Blessed Solanus Casey for you to help you to pray. Okay? This other one is Blessed Carlo Acutis. How many of you Blessed Carlo Acutis? Okay. Carlo Acutis, he died in 2006, and you can see he's a young guy. He died when he was 15, right? Died of cancer, died of leukemia, and uh, he is a phenomenal saint, really a beautiful saint. And if you have difficulty with technology, if you've got technology addiction, if you can't stop playing games, or if you can't stay focused because you're always on your phone, he is super helpful to overcome temptation to a technology addiction, okay? So if you want, you can actually take a couple of cards. The prayer is in the back is in Italian, so you can learn your Italian, all right? But... But it's, these are, have all been touched to the tomb of Blessed Carlo Acutis, right? This one you might know. Who's this guy? You may not know him. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Carlo Acutis, yes. Yes, correct. He died in 2006.
Yes, so, so it's, it's a little bit confusing about he is, he is partially incorrupt. So he's not completely incorrupt. When they dug up his body, he died in 2006. When they dug up his body, it was still mostly intact. You know, and so that's pretty remarkable, right? And a lot of the saints, when they've been dug up, they've been intact. Martin de Porres, when he was dug up uh, 20 some years after his death, his tomb emitted a smell of roses and fragrant flowers. So it wasn't the smell of a decaying body. He was completely, perfectly intact, and he smelled amazing. So again, the odor of sanctity, right? So this one is St. John Paul II, and this is a piece of his tunic. So this is a second class relic of St. John Paul II, who just died. Um, a few years ago in 2005, right? Great Pope and Saint. Saint John Vianney, how many know Saint John Vianney? Love him, Pat patron saint of parish priests. This coin was touched to his heart. So his heart did a traveling relic tour here in Oregon. So it's a third class relic of the heart of Saint John Vianney. So if you have uh, any, any prayer requests for him, he's there. This of course is Saint Alice. So this is a bone. This is a first class relic of our patroness here at the parish, Saint Alice, okay? so. That one is here, and St. Alice, of course, is a phenomenal patroness, and we're gonna talk about her more in December. These are rocks from the cave of St. Michael, where St. Michael appeared, so that's kind of fun. Somebody brought them back for me from, from Italy. This one we don't have papers for, so you don't have to believe it, okay? It's more of a private veneration, but this supposedly is a piece of the finger of St. Elizabeth, the mother of um, John the Baptist. So for those mothers who have difficulty conceiving or infertility issues, we don't have the papers for it, so I can't like do official veneration of it, but if you would like to, you can. But like I said, I do not have proof. So I don't want you to put your hope in it. Um, it is a family heirloom that was handed on to us without the papers, okay? But if someone receives a healing miracle through venerating it, please let me know, okay? Okay, what I wanna do is I wanna teach you how to venerate a relic, okay? And then I'm gonna let you just have time to do that, okay? The way you can venerate a relic is just to recognize, look, we're, we're not worshiping these things. What we're doing is recognizing that God's presence is still operating through them. So we, worship is offered to God, right? Because he's the one who does the things in his saints. The cross is only efficacious because it has the blood of Jesus soaked into it who saves the world, right? The saints' bodies only have grace because God's grace is still operative in them. It's not because they can somehow do that on their own power, right? So anything happens only because of God's permission. So if you have brought something with you, if you're having difficulty at school, if you have anxiety, if you have depression, if you are angry, if you've got difficulties, you're afraid, something bad is happening in your family, you have pain, you need healing, whatever it is, ask God for it through the intercession of the saints that you're venerating, okay? That's how we venerate a relic. And you can do it several ways. You can come up, you can touch them, right? You can touch them, it's okay. You can pick them up, you can press them to the place where it's hurting. So if you've got a leg injury, you can put it, touch it to your leg. If you've got a heart healing that you need, you can place it to your heart, right? Things like that. You can kiss it if you wish as a sign of devotion. You can genuflect, you can just touch it and make the sign of the cross however you would like to do that, but keep an atmosphere of prayer. What I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna allow you, you can come up at any time and you can just venerate any of these relics that you would like to, okay? And you can just kind of wait in line for the next one. If there's one that's not being visited, you can go to that one. And we'll just do that for about five to 10 minutes, okay? And we're just gonna have a time of quiet so we can let everybody have an experience with that. Well, let's just begin with a prayer and then you can just come up to anyone that you feel drawn to. The saints choose you. St. Catherine of Siena chose me when I was in college. I was not expecting it. I was reading her book and she hit me really hard with truth, right? And so I knew that she had adopted me, right? And that might be you. When you come up to one of them, you might feel a really strong pull to one of these saints. That means they want to be your friend to pray for you, to help you. Sound good? Let's pray. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. Father, I ask that through this time of prayer, where we encounter your saints and the instruments of the passion, that our hearts would be moved and that we would be healed. Amen. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. So you can come up in any order you want. You don't have to wait. You can just come up right now if you want. And we'll just take a few minutes in quiet and let's just keep an atmosphere of prayer. And then after a little bit, we'll come back and we'll talk about the experience, okay? Just go ahead and go.
Now, just so you know, if you brought a rosary or if you brought a medal or something, if you touch it to the relic, then you have a relic to take home with you. So, yeah. You gotta tell folks what just happened. Important that we give testimony of what happened. So, how bad was your leg? How bad was it hurt? Uh, it was like a, like a seven or eight. It's like a seven or eight. And we took relic of Saint Alice and we touched it to your leg and asked her to pray for you. And what happened now? I don't feel pain no more. Show them. Just try and move around. How's it feel? Feels good. <laughs> you see, like, this isn't a story, guys. Like we're not making this up. The saints are alive. Como? Goal, yeah, that's right, yeah. No, the saints are alive, brothers and sisters, so it's really beautiful, yeah. It's, it's really important we ask with faith, brothers and sisters, because these can just be a museum of things that are interesting, but we recognize that heaven and earth are connected right now that God loves us and he's still operative. And the saints, St. Alice just healed this guy's leg just by praying, just very simply, right? So, yeah. Everybody loved Carlo Acutis. I ran out. I'll get some more if I have more of him. Yeah. As long as Casey. Yeah. Was anyone else experiencing a physical or an emotional healing while you were praying in front of the relics? Is anyone needing prayer for healing right now that you would like to pray? It's free. It's easy. That's why we do the healing nights, is because stuff like this happens all the time when we pray.
Now, if you took one of the relic cards with you, please keep it in a safe place and put it in your prayer corner in your room or by your bed, right? And so when you go to bed at night, you can ask him to pray for you, okay? You can touch it, you can venerate it just like you did today and ask the saint directly. If you took Carlo Acutis, ask, Blessed Carlo Acutis, please pray for me. Help me with what I need right now, right? Or Blessed Solanus Casey, I'm really having a hard time with my schoolwork. I'm really having a difficult time. Please help me by your prayers, right? The saints are powerful and they're alive right now and they're listening and they can help us when we ask them to pray for us. Right, so folks are starting to come back in. Just wanted real quickly, just to ask, was that good? Was that kind of neat? The church has a lot of treasures. We're gonna be talking more about the treasures of the church as we go on through the year and how to pray better. But I hope this was a good experience for you and that um, we'll continue to pray. Um, as an announcement, por todos los padres, um, anyone who wants to be involved with youth ministry, or any work in the parish involved with youth at all, we need you to be call, trained with Call to Protect. If you have not done that yet, we have a training this Wednesday, and we need you to sign up. It's in the, the parish lobby to sign up, okay? Both English and in Spanish, we have sign up. So, por los que quieren ayudarnos con los jóvenes en cualquier área de la iglesia, es importante para ser voluntario que tiene ese entrenamiento. Si no tiene entrenamiento por Call to Protect, necesito registrar por las clases. Hay una clase ese miércoles en la tarde, pero necesito registrarse. La registración está en el atrio de la iglesia. Por favor, hágalo. ¿Ok? Muy bien. Yeah. Ok, good. As people are coming back in, um, we'll go ahead and we'll do uh, some Q&A. Questions. We got our microphone people ready to run. So if you've got a microphone, or if you, if you have a question, you just raise your hand and a microphone runner will run to you. We had one question from the question box. Just so you know, we do have a question tin that you can submit questions anonymously. It's in the lobby. Uh, one, the question that was in there was, what's the difference between a bishop and an archbishop? Great question, we get that a lot. Uh, the difference is, is that they're both bishops but one is in charge of a, a region that is called an archdiocese. So a, a bishop is a bishop of a diocese, an archbishop is a bishop of an archdiocese. So we are in the archdiocese of Portland, and so we have an archbishop, whereas the diocese that is in the east part, so when I say diocese, who knows what that word means? Nobody, of course not, okay, right. A diocese is a fancy word for a territory, a geographic area, okay? So Oregon is split up into two dioceses, okay? The western half of Oregon is called the Archdiocese of Portland. The eastern half is called the Diocese of Baker, okay? So 
we have a bishop here, Archbishop Sample, who is in charge of us here in Western Oregon. In Eastern Oregon, their bishop is Bishop Liam Carey, because they have a different bishop than we do, although they're in the same state that we are. Does that make sense? Okay, so we have both a diocese and an archdiocese in the state of Oregon. Both Bishop Carey and Bishop Archbishop Sample are both bishops, but just one of them is in charge of an archdiocese and one is not. So that's the only difference. Make sense? Good. Other questions about tonight or about anything else you'd like to ask? One up here. And then her behind, and then Mary behind. Yep, go ahead. This is just off of that question. So what is the difference between an archdiocese and a diocese? Usually just historical importance. So uh, it, it's, I don't know the, all the calculations that go into it. The Archdiocese of Portland is the second oldest archdiocese in the United States of America. So the Archdiocese of Boston is the, is the oldest in the United States and we are the second oldest. So it's fun historical fact. So that's why we're in our diocese, because we are a historically significant diocese. The Oregon territories, you know, we, we, before we became the Archdiocese of Portland, I mean, we were a very old for the United States diocese. Yeah. I always feel like people kind of got a bad deal if they came from a line where it's like this line of people will be not blessed. Yes. <laughs> I always feel bad for all those people. Yes. That's a raw deal for all that whole line. Quite a raw deal indeed. Yes. And that's, I think it's important we look at that, that yeah, um, that's the drama of history, is that the family you're born into determines a lot. I mean, we talk about systemic poverty. I mean, it's, it's saying there's structures of poverty that are created. If your grandpa's poor, you're gonna be poor, probably unless you break the cycle. Like, you gotta work really hard to overcome that, and some people do, right? But other people, they just kinda let it continue to spiral, right? Same, if your grandpa's an alcoholic, you're probably, dad's probably an alcoholic and you're going to be an alcoholic unless if you take active measures to correct it, right? And then there's certain things that are just so complicated because they spread out over hundreds of years and there's the Hatfields and the McCoy kind of problem that happens. It's just how human nature works. And so Jesus Christ offers us the solution because saying it's not about your biology. It's not about where you came from. We can level the playing ground. It's not that you're black or white or Latino or Anglo or Nicaraguan or whatever, right? It's, or Chinese, it doesn't matter. If you are in Christ, you have the same dignity. So that's the good news of the gospel is saying, because yeah, if we're just enslaved to the way of the world, the way of the world says where you come from determines who you are. But the Lord says, no, I, I determine who you are. I made you and I remake you in Christ. Yeah, great question. But yeah, we do feel bad for them. But part of it is saying that actions have consequences, and so some of the things we see play out in the Old Testament are simply the consequences of the father's really bad decisions, or the grandpa's really bad decisions, and it has echoes for three generations, or even four, or more. It could be hundreds of years sometimes. Because the more power you have, the more effect your decisions have. So the king, when he's sinful, it wrecks nations, right? And so we're seeing that happen right now, right? That's what's playing out in politics, because the more power you have, if you're not responsible with it, your decisions have catastrophic impact for generations. Yeah, that was John Joseph. So far in Genesis, I've seen a lot of people, they live all the way to 100 and something, whereas nowadays we have people who only live up to 90. That's a long, 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 long lifespan. Yes. So how come over time, it seems like they had worse conditions, they lived longer, now we have better conditions, and it's easier for us to live longer, yet we just don't. It's a great question. It's kind of like the guy who just died. Uh, this is a, a, a fascinating story. The world's dirtiest man, did you guys see this story? Yeah, the world's dirtiest man who lived in Iran, and he lived to be 94 years old. He didn't take a bath for 60 years. 60 years, didn't believe in baths. Now, I don't recommend you imitate him because he didn't have any friends, okay? <laughs> he lived in the desert by himself, lived in a cave, and ate raw food, and like ate raw animals, and like smoked animal dookie, and uh, didn't bathe, and he lived to be 94. I don't know how that works. Sometimes it's just a genetic lottery and you win. I don't know, because like, he should not have lived that long, right? But the fact is, is that yes, in the Old Testament we see long life as a sign of holiness and blessing, right? 
So the fact is, is that the patriarchs live really long lives as a sign of their holiness and lifespans get shorter because wickedness keeps entering into the world. That's the, the message of the scriptures. So, yeah, other questions? Yeah, Karen. In our Bible here, we have the angel in the Four lion. characters on the front? Yeah, the four characters on the front, yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. And then we also have it here on the in the banners. Very good. Is there a reason why they're in a certain order? Very good. Yes. So the, these four creatures that we have here, yes, you, you'll see them on, if you have the Ignatius uh, uh, Bible that we recommended, you'll see the four uh, living creatures, which are described in the book of Revelation, right? And uh, they're each representative of the four gospels. So these are symbolic of the four gospels. You've got... Uh, uh, the Matthew, the, the man, you've got Mark, the, the lion, you've got Luke, the ox, and then John, the eagle. And these are all uh, very traditional representations of the four gospel writers. So they come from the book of Revelation. Yep. So, and the reason why is because you see in Matthew's gospel, you see how Jesus is described as the son of man, right? In Mark's gospel, you see kind of him being the lion of Judah, Luke, um, forget the ox there's some sort of, and, and John's gospel is the most highly elevated theologically and so the idea is the eagle who soars high above the clouds to see God with unveiled eye that's kind of the idea that John pierces the mysteries of revelation yeah yeah you caught me on that one I don't remember all the significance I need to look that up someone look that up that's homework look up what the ox means okay good great other questions Wow, you guys all have it figured out. Okay. Um, the adults kind of walked in here. We did a little relic expose of the different relics we have in there in the church. Next, and, and actually we had somebody who was healed through the intercession of St. Alice. That was awesome. So this is kind of a segue. Next week we'll be having our healing night. Okay. This is the last healing night we'll have for the year um, because we won't have one in December. December 8th is the Immaculate Conception, so we'll be having Mass and a beautiful consecration uh, to Our Lady. So invite your friends, right? Because... Jesus wants to heal us. And as we're talking about how to pray better, the healing night is one way of praying. I know it's not everybody's cup of tea. Some people don't like praise and worship music. It's fine. You don't have to like it. It's not, it's not a problem, right? Uh, there's different kinds of prayer. We're going to be walking through that this year with, with the youth about how to pray in different ways. And this is one way to pray through music and through intercessory prayer. So we try and blend a few different things where we have time to lay hands on people to pray for healing, uh, to take some time before the Blessed Sacrament in adoration. Um, but whenever we're in the presence of Jesus and the saints, amazing things happen. And we're going to pray for you that you get out of that wheelchair. I was going to focus. So pray for Don right now. So Don, you guys know the story of Don, right? Okay, so Don, his hip is gone, right? Gone and super gone, like needs to be completely rebuilt. Doesn't exist, okay? Kaput, blew out, terrible, gone, okay? And he was in terrible pain, and the August healing night... He came and his pain went from an 11 to half, right? And it stayed that way constant. And then September night, it went down to zero. And it's been zero since. Now, his hip is still gone, kaput. So what's happening right now as Don is sitting here is God's continuous miracle for the last three months. Right? He's been operative since August. Like, he has been actively involved in completely eliminating the pain, even though the external situation has not changed. And his surgery got kicked back, and so I think it's God giving time for us to pray for him in faith, for him to get up and walk. So you want to do that right now? <laughs> I think St. Alice wants to, wants to at least do a little bit of more work. I have no idea. I'm nuts right now. I don't know. We're going to do this. Okay. Let's do this right now. Okay. Because uh, St. Alice, of course, is our patroness, and she, she loves us. And uh, somebody came up and asked, what do we do? Uh, who's, who's here had their leg healed? All right. Had their leg healed. Who's there? Where is he? What's your name? Where is he? Where is he? He's hiding right now. Where'd he go? Yeah, what's your name? What? Yeah, what's your name? Carlos. Yeah, so Carlos, your, pain, your leg was at a pain seven, yeah? And then you're asking, what do you do? Like, how do you do this? And they're like, we just take it and you put it to your leg and we just you know, pray and ask, right? That's what we did, right? Wasn't anything spectacular. We just asked St. Alice to pray for you, right? And then what happened? It stopped hurting, like immediately. Like, went from a seven to a zero, right? Very quick. So, when a saint does something and prays, like, it's usually God like winking at us and being like, oh, she's active right now tonight. She wants to pray for us in a particular way. So we're going to pray for Don right now. Sound like fun? Let's do that. Yeah. Now, we have no expectation of it because, again, like, God's doing this. So if it's his timeline, he wants to heal his, his hip tonight, great. If he doesn't, wants him to go through surgery, fine, because what he's already done is amazing, right? 
Can we just thank God for what he's done already? Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus, for taking the pain of 11 down to nothing, even though nothing changed. <laughs> Everything changed. Thank you, Jesus. And I ask you, Lord, through the intercession of St. Alice, that if it be your will, that you'd completely rebuild his hip. Come, Holy Spirit. Through the intercession of St. Alice, we ask that you would build new bones, new tissue, new tendons, put everything back in place, femur, all connected bones. I don't even know the names of them, but you do, God. I see you rebuild this hip through the intercession of St. Alice for the glory of your name. Amen. Yeah. Amen. How it feels we were praying? Very numb. Very numb. Okay. So like typically that was what happened before is like there's a numbness. So it's so like you felt like there's a numbness kind of went there again. Okay. Like a shot of Novocaine just went right into that spot. Huh, interesting. Like, if you move your leg, do you notice any difference? No pain there? Okay, it wasn't, it wasn't before. Okay, all right. <laughs> can you test it out in any possible way to just kind of see how it feels? Like, as you, as you, like can you, you, can, you can sort of get up and see how that feels, yeah? You can normally get up anyway, folks, but, but just like with assistance and stuff, so... It's not dangerous, but yeah. I mean, it definitely, I can make it hurt right now if I wanted to. Okay, you can make it hurt if you want to, but it, but it doesn't. Okay. Okay, cool. Just wanted to check. <laughs> There's no hurt in asking, right? Because I can't possibly do that. Come on, right? Right? Okay, so we'll just, we'll just thank St. Alice for what she's doing right now. We'll just ask for a completion. Thank you, St. Alice, for bringing healing to Carlos and ask that you would intercede for Don, that you would prepare for him a way for a new hip even without surgery, even without the Mayo Clinic. If it be your will, just for the glory of your name so that people would believe. And even if you don't, it's already amazing what you're doing and we're thanking you for that. Amen. Amen. All right, very good. We'll go ahead and we'll get prepared for adoration and we'll conclude for the night and we'll see you next week for the healing night. Now, homework for two weeks from now, um, it's the chapter on Exodus, okay, in your Bible Basics book. So it's the very next chapter in your book. And the scriptures that you'll read are the suggested ones that are there for that chapter. So I think it's Exodus 1 through 19, a few maybe different things. But it's in your Bible Basics book, the recommended scriptures for the next lesson. But that's in two weeks from now. So you have time to get caught up. If you didn't read Genesis, you have time to catch up. If you don't have a Bible yet, we have additional Bibles in the lobby. But invite your friends and come ready for the healing night next Thursday evening. Okay.
O salutari socia, qui celipani sostium, bella premunto silia, da rober fer auxilium, unitrino quedomino, sit sempiterna gloria, Qui vitam sine termino, nomis donet in patria. Amen. Jesus, truly present in the most holy Eucharist, we ask that as you have poured out grace through your saints, so you would pour out even more grace through your holy body and blood, so that all would believe. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Eternal rest grant unto them, O Lord, and let perpetual light shine upon them. May the souls of the faithful departed to the mercy of God rest in peace. <laughs>